morning. I'm Laura, and I'll be reading from God's Word in Romans 3, verses 9 through 20. And I'm reading from the NIV. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Amen. Thank you, Laura. Would you pray with me as we begin to open the word of God? Our God in heaven, we thank you once again. Here we sit as your people with your word opened. Let us hear what you have to say to us. Give us a glimpse of your heart for us, for your glory. Use your word and bring about all that you have already determined to accomplish in our hearts and in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're getting near to the end of this first section here in Romans. Paul is bringing his big point to begin with to a conclusion, and we're reaching that this morning. We're nine messages into the book of Romans, and uh, looking ahead to this coming weekend as we celebrate Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, uh, securing salvation for us, and it has timed out beautifully because on Friday and on Sunday we'll be looking at verses 21 uh, down to verse 26, even down into verse 31. And uh, if this week you want to be preparing your hearts, I would encourage you just to be reading through verses 21 to 31, allowing them just to be uh, kind of bouncing around in your own heart and mind on, on Friday, specifically just looking at the phrase that God put forward as a propitiation by his blood in verse 25, and uh, just be meditating on those. But we come to the conclusion of his first main argument. And I just want to remind us where we have been going. We've been following Paul's argument all the way from chapter 1, verse 18. And he has been just methodically making this argument that as has been read, all are under sin. Every human being is under sin. We'll expand on that verdict Here in just our two verses, verses 19 and 20 this morning. But he has just been methodically working his way, driving home the point, every person is under sin. And last week we talked about what it means to be under sin. But he began looking at the the world at large, the pagan world in general. This world that we live in is under sin. In chapter 2, is what he began with the self-righteous person. The one who says, yes, that world out there, absolutely. They deserve the condemnation and the judgment of God on them. And Paul just turns his attention on himself and says, even you, you self-righteous person, even you are under sin. Then as he finishes chapter 2, he draws his attention to those that are outside of the law. Specifically, they they don't have the Mosaic law. They don't have the the advantage and the benefit of God's chosen people, the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel have. Those that are outside of the law, even they are under sin. And even though they may be outside of the Mosaic law, they have the law that God has written onto their hearts. And then he directs his attention and spends a bulk of his time addressing his own people, 
the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, even you are under sin. Having all the advantage of having the word of God and the promises of God and having a special covenant with God does not shield you from God's wrath, nor does it make you give you this special condition outside of God's impartiality. No, even you, that doesn't solve your sin problem. Even you are under sin. And driving home this argument and presenting us the reality of the human condition, being under sin, but also the character of God. As I've mentioned, that he is impartial. That all human beings will stand under sin before their creator. And they stand as guilty. And God in his impartiality always rewards righteousness and always punishes unrighteousness. And as Paul has been just laying this out, he comes to this conclusion in verses 19 and 20. And if there's a big idea from these verses, I would, I'd like us to remember this, is that every human being is empty-handed before God. As he brings this argument to a close, he also uses it to transition into these verses to close out chapter 3, 21 to 31. But he's bringing it to a close and just simply every human being is empty-handed before God. Now immediately, perhaps, or initially, we would think, this is not good. <laughs> Where's the hope in this? But I hope as, as a result of looking at these verses, we see them as hopeful. For remember, Paul started on this argument, this journey, with chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Where he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. This part of the gospel that every human being is empty handed before God, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to save. And in all reality, a phrase like this, a truth like this, where Paul is landing, might just be the most freeing message God's people can offer. Why might this be? Well, I'm sure many of us here can identify with the author J.D. Greer. He's a pastor as well. It's, uh, he wrote the book that we've recommended uh, here in March and April to be reading, just titled The Gospel. And in his introduction to the book, he introduces it by being vulnerable, really, and saying that he had found Christianity to be wearisome. And maybe you, just me saying the fact that Christianity can be wearisome, maybe you know exactly where he's coming from. The conformity to a set of rules can be wearisome. All of the don't do's can become wearisome. On the other end of the spectrum, though, Christianity be can become wearisome because of all the conformity of, well, real Christian, fill in the blank. Well, real Christians, they witness. And I look at my life and I'm not doing enough. Real Christians are going to stand up here and go overseas on a missions trip. They'll do it once for a couple weeks and they're going to go do six months. Real Christians show in their giving. And I need to give more. Kingdom living, our level of commitment. It's exhausting. It's discouraging. It's frustrating. It's disheartening because the human bent is to earn God's favor. And a Christianity that is presented with that as its baseline 
to earn the favor of God. Conformity to the rules and conformity to the ideals is exhausting. It's wearisome. And quite frankly, this human bent that we have to earn God's favor, it is a futile effort. And so hopefully I want to present in these verses why a phrase like this, every human being is empty-handed before God, is a freeing message. just want us to notice Paul's thought process as he brings this first, conclu- this first argument to a conclusion. In verse 19 he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. First of all, he's telling us that the law is speaking. Now he just got finished quoting a number of different Old Testament passages and assembling them in a way that is reiterating and driving home this sense that all are under sin. There is no one who is righteous. We looked at that last week. But I had Laura read that again because when he says that whatever the law says, it speaks. Whatever the law says, not just the verses, the the sections that he's quoting in verses 10 through 18, but the law in its entirety. It is speaking. And it is speaking to those who are in the law, he says. It speaks to those who are under the law. So Paul is still addressing his own people, these Jewish people, and he's saying, whatever the law is speaking, it is speaking to those who are under the law. And so you can imagine just immediately his own people hearing perhaps Paul, reading Paul, quoting these Old Testament passages, and Paul is reminding them, listen, these are your scriptures. And these scriptures are not speaking to a pagan world. They are speaking to you. Wait a minute. 10 through 18 are for me? Paul says, absolutely. And really what he's confronting here is what was being heard from the law. The Jewish people as a nation were hearing that the law sets us apart from God and it puts us as an ethnic ethnic group it puts us in covenant and it provides a means of justification but Paul is saying that you've heard the wrong message the Old Testament the scriptures the law is speaking to you are you listening are you hearing what it's saying or are you telling it what to say because they had been making that mistake for generations. And the law is speaking because the law is seeking to accomplish something. So he says in verse 19 that whatever the law says, it's speaking to those who are under the law, those who set their lives around it. It is speaking so that has a purpose, every mouth may be stopped. That every mouth may be silenced. The mouths of those who are under the law, the mouths of those who are hearing the law, that they would be quieted. That there would be this honest recognition, this humble acceptance that I have nothing to say in my defense. The Old Testament law in God's purpose was designed to speak to his people to accomplish something, for them to be quieted, for their mouths to have no more to say in their defense. Empty-handed. so that every mouth may be stopped. But then he broadens it, and the whole world might be held accountable to God. It's interesting that Paul would bring now into the picture the whole world. He's speaking to his Jewish nation, those who are under the law. Why then does he broaden it here? 
I would suggest that if the Jews, the Jewish nation, who had all the privileges and advantages, if they are no better off, as he has already said in verse 9, if this group of people who have all of the advantages and the benefits that don't shield them from God's wrath and anger, that don't solve their sin problem, if, if this group of people are no better off, then it stands to reason that the whole world is also liable to God. If, if this specially privileged group of people is not outside of God's accountability, then it stands to reason that the whole world is. And this law, God's message is speaking to accomplish, to drive home the point to those that are listening, you have no defense. And if those that are in a privileged position have no defense, then it stands to reason that those outside of that, the whole world has no defense and is accountable is liable for and so Paul's asking the question have you agreed have you agreed with what that Old Testament scriptures are communicating to you have you listened to them or have you made them say what you want them to say and have you agreed with this message that is the whole point. To bring his people into agreement. I hear what you're saying. And there is no good way in me. I agree. Now, why would God give the law? And why would God have the law try to accomplish and communicate that? Because there is a truth behind it. And that truth is in verse 20. And that truth is that by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. That is the underlying truth. In fact, we could, we could start with verse 20. That this underlying truth is that there is no human being that by their good works will be justified before God. And if that's true, God has put the Old Testament law in place to communicate that because it's true. So I put the law in place so that it will communicate and you will walk away hearing that there's no one who is righteous. Not even me. And, and being underneath the law's influence and hearing its message, my mouth is, is quieted because what is the human bent to defend? The human bent is to say, but I've done this to earn. And the law is put in place to say that God does not operate that way. You cannot earn it. There is no person who will be justified before God, declared righteous by your good deeds. There's no one. He says because it's, it's through the law that the knowledge of sin comes. Paul will expand on that phrase later in his message. But it's classically illustrated. Don't look out that window. Well, the fact that we say, don't lie, it, it arouses the desire to lie within us because we are under sin. You didn't look out the window, did you? I hope not. If not, you get A for the day for illustrating it perfectly. The law communicates 
and tells us what sin is. And it's showing that it is inside of us. And that because of my sin, I will not be justified by my good works. Because as the Old Testament law is showing us, I can't and I won't because of my sin. This is a freeing message. That there is not a single person by coming to church here this morning that God will look at you coming to church and say, all right, here are the balances. Your good works measure up to my standard. That could be going to church, reading your Bible, praying, helping the old lady across the street, whatever it may be. And, and is this not the greatest concern for every human being? It should be communicated constantly that every human being, number one, will be held accountable before God. Every human being will answer to their creator. And it will be questioned. And the only thing that will matter, are you righteous? To be justified is to be declared righteous. Righteous. To be determined to be righteous. And we're seeing from Paul's conclusion here is that there, there will not be a person ever who will not stand before their creator with the question at hand, that only question that matters, the only concern is am I righteous? As I stand before God at the end of my life, that's all that matters. Am I righteous? Do I meet your standard? And that's the only thing that matters for us today. Is that we will stand before our creator. And we will be held accountable. Am I righteous? And Paul is communicating that there is not one righteous person. There is not one righteous, there is not one human being that at the end of their life will stand before their creator to whom they are accountable and they will stand individually. And there is not a single human being that will have gathered enough good works to tip the scales in their favor. Not one. And that's the big idea for us today. Is the question is, are you empty-handed? Are you empty-handed? Because Paul is telling us, the law is telling us, our Creator is telling us that you are empty, that you have nothing to bring to me to tip the scales in favor to determine that you are righteous. And our takeaway truth is, is, is as Paul is telling us that I will not be justified before God by my good works. I will not be justified before God by my good works. In Daniel chapter 5, verse 27, God's people are still in captivity in Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar has since passed away. Daniel is aging nearing the time of his, end of the time of his ministry. The Babylon Empire is about to fall to the Persian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar's grandson or great-grandson is having a party on the eve of the Persian invasion. In fact, he knows that the Persian army is invading his land and he's having a party and he breaks out all of the temple utensils that they took from Jerusalem and using those and defaming Yahweh and perhaps you're familiar with this as Belshazzar was partying blaspheming God he sees a hand writing on the wall 
meeny, meeny, tuckle parson. Weighed, measured, numbered. Belshazzar has no idea what this means. He's beside himself. He's fearful. He calls out to his grandma. What do I do? She says, hey, you need to go get Daniel. And Daniel comes and he interprets this to Belshazzar. And he says, the message of this, Yahweh, the king of kings, the lord of lords, whom your great-grandfather Nebuchadnezzar bowed to and, and honored, his, this is his message for you, that you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And that night, Belshazzar and his kingdom fell. But that message to Belshazzar is the message to every one of us that we have been weighed, that we have been measured, and that I have been found wanting. I am empty of the righteousness needed to skip, to tip the scales in my favor before God. I am empty handed before my Creator. I am empty handed of anything that would bring upon me God's favor and say, You are righteous. And our take home task what do we do with this? Embrace it. Embrace this. Daily approach God with closed mouths and empty hands. You have nothing to offer to your God. To cause Him to favor you. We are empty in our sin. And the beauty of the gospel is the message, come to your creator empty-handed. You know, we, we have this righteousness problem. We don't have it. And the temptation for every human being is that I need to generate it. And that is exhausting. And God is saying the message of the gospel is you cannot. So don't come to your creator empty-handed. I have nothing that warrants your favor upon me, O oh God. And the message of the gospel is to say, listen, you are empty-handed. You've got to find the righteousness another way. And look at verse 21. Some foreshadowing for us next week. If, if I can't find the right, if I can't provide the righteousness, where in the world am I going to get it? But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God, God's righteousness, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Where does this void of righteousness get filled so that I can stand before God and gain His favor and declare me righteous? It's not from me. I find it in Jesus. But I have to come empty-handed and confess. And if you have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is at the very beginning Today, listen to the scriptures, agree with the scriptures, and come to your Creator empty handed. I confess, I have nothing in me to gain your favor, but I trust that you have provided Jesus Christ to be my righteousness for me. He lived the life that I could not and will not. He died a death he didn't deserve, but I did, and I do. 
And Paul would tell the Corinthians that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become his righteousness. And to accept Jesus Christ is to accept his gift where he says, Steve Strong, you are void of righteousness. You will not gain the favor of my Father. So I'm going to live as a substitute for you. And I give you my righteousness. And I will take your sin. You are void of it. Take mine. And I have a choice. Will I take it? And we take it by faith. And it is a life lived by faith. It is trusting that my only hope in being held accountable to my creator, when, I, when my life is over and I stand before my creator and I am held accountable and he says, Steve, do you measure up? I can say no, but Jesus did for me. I have his righteousness and he took my guilt and my sin. And the Father to whom I'm accountable looks at me and he sees the righteousness of Jesus and I measure up in Jesus Christ. And as Paul writes earlier in his argument, it is at that point that God will render to me according to the works of Jesus and he will reward me with eternity. If you have never trusted in Jesus Christ, never come to your Father empty-handed, void of anything to gain His favor, let today be that day where you put your trust in your substitute, Jesus Christ. But this concept doesn't end there. This is your daily relationship with God. Paul would write in a parallel letter in the Galatians to this church in that those first missionary journey. He's like, did you start your relationship with God by works? No. Then are you going to finish it by works? No. I think for a lot of Christians, we think, well, we start our relationship with God by trusting in His grace. But after that moment, it's all about, I got to do something to keep his favor. God does not operate that way. This is Paul's point there in Galatians chapter 3. You didn't start that way. You're not going to end that way. God does not demand us to obey in order to gain his favor after our salvation. For he has said, I freely give you my favor. Stop with the hamster wheel. This is the power of the gospel. The heart, the heart that loves our Father and our Savior it is not indigenous in me. I don't have that heart, but God gives me that heart. And so it's not I have to stop doing these things and I need to keep doing these things more and more and more and more because I want God's favor. It's you have his favor. And because of that, and every single day, I daily approach God. I wake up every single morning and I challenge and encourage every one of us as a 24-7 worshiper to empty myself before God every single morning. God, I come to you empty-handed. There's not righteousness. There's not an ounce of righteousness in me. I only come to you with the righteousness of Jesus. And I know that I only have your favor, your complete favor on my life today because of Jesus. Help me to live out of that favor. That's growing in grace. Every single day. 
being found in Jesus Christ. God is not withholding some favor until a little bit later in your walk with Him. You have it completely. And so every day, start there. And what does this mean for us as alongsiders? Like, th- just thinking about that as a 24-7 worshiper, that, that God's grace is amazing because he has bestowed his favor on me in full because of Jesus Christ, and there's not an ounce that he's withholding until something better happens. Imagine what that would be like in the relationships that believers have with each other. Husbands with their wives. Wives with their husbands. Parents with their children. Children with their siblings. Models of that kind of grace. You do not have to earn. I give it to you freely. And for us as, as, go, as a go person, get to empty. Our adversary has completely deceived this world by saying, yes, there's Jesus, but that's not all of God's favor. You have to do, 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 do. And in that scenario... Those that believe in Jesus, but also are trusting in their doing to gain God's favor, are still under their sin. And our adversary has completely deceived. Their hearts and minds are darkened, and they continue to be dead in their sin. And my aim as a go person is I've got to get to empty. God, help me to lead them and to teach and to preach the word of God as an ambassador that they have nothing before you, that they can offer you nothing, that they are empty before you and they need Jesus. Get to empty because empty is hope. This idea of being empty and closed-mouthed before God is a freeing message. For when I am free from my effort, I can truly love. And I hope that for all of us. Would you pray with me? Our God and Father in heaven, There is not one person here in this room that has in and of themselves the righteousness to gain your favor. And we come to you empty-handed, our mouths shut for we have no more defense. And Father, we cling to Jesus. We cling to Jesus to Jesus for it is only in Jesus that we find the righteousness our lives are void of and it's only in Jesus in having his righteousness that we find your favor complete and full God fill our hearts with joy as we empty ourselves daily and cling to Christ We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.